Hello and welcome to Need to Know. I'm Ross Coulthart from Australia and in Los Angeles, my co-host and good buddy, Bryce Zabel, who's in fact in, <laughs> drum roll, San Francisco. How are you, mate? I'm fine. I was saying, I was thinking to myself, well, here I go. I have to correct Ross <laughs> on the fact error in the very beginning. So I'm glad that didn't happen. No, I am in San Francisco uh, where uh, I'm at a condo that's under construction. So we've asked everyone to stop pounding and sawing for a short period of time so we can get this done. And I'm looking forward to it. Now, this week is a very important week because we are on the cusp, on the threshold of what is likely to be a very interesting report to the Congress from the Pentagon reporting as required under the National Defence Authorisation Act requirements on UAPs. So we've decided to make this a full show, a very special show. We've got two very important guests coming on a bit later, Ryan Robbins from Post Disclosure World and Christina Gomez from Paradigm Shifts. We're going to do an analysis of the implications of what we believe is in the report to Congress. But before we do that, Bryce and I, as we always like to do, an analysis of the important news that has transpired in the weeks since our last podcast. What do you think is the most important thing that we've had in the last couple of weeks, mate? Well, I think the thing that's gotten a lot of uh, attention and certainly gotten people writing articles about it in the mainstream media has been the fact that NASA finally uh, uh, laid out the 16, I believe it's 16 individuals that will make up its study group. Uh, and people uh, should be aware that NASA has, after years of saying, we don't do UFOs, uh, only recently said, yeah, we'll look into this UAP thing for about, uh, for about nine months and we'll get back to you. So NASA has gotten into the UFO slash UAP game. They've given themselves a nine month time to look into it. And I guess the only, and so a lot of people have been covering that, everyone from CNN to uh, the, the, the magazines, of course. But uh, they also are only going to be looking into, as I understand it, the unclassified part of this. So I think there is a flag on the play, but I'm glad to see that they're getting involved. Yeah, I, I don't really expect much from the NASA UAP investigations, to be honest. I don't doubt that the integrity of the scientists is um, unchallenged. But if we're going to limit what NASA is allowed to look at in its research to unclassified data, you're wasting your time because pretty much all the interesting stuff is classified. To me, the most important article of the last couple of weeks is... Well, the first one for me is, of course, the New York Times Julian Barnes story that oh. we have to discuss. I think it's very, very important that the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal have both written articles attempting to preempt and anticipate the uh, findings of what the report to you, uh, Congress will say. And frankly, I don't think the Julian Barnes New York Times story was worthy of the New York Times uh, there's one saying as a journalist, a journalist is only ever as good as his or her sources. I've got right. stories wrong in my time because of dud sources. And I suspect that Julian Barnes has been led by the nose by people in the intelligence community who frankly wanted to try and preempt the implications of this report. Don't you agree? I, I, well, I do agree with it, but I, I... I think I would slant it slightly. I'm not sure that his sources are bad because he knows where to find sources as well as you and I do. Uh, his context is missing. He's written, he's managed to write an entire article for the New York Times that basically says, okay, uh, the people that have been looking to explain UFOs say that most of them are explainable, so there's nothing to see here. Well, we know that most of them are explained. That's not the issue. Even Congress has said, uh, we don't care about the ones that are explained. We want to know about the ones that aren't explained. And so I think Julian Barnes, when he wrote that for the Times, uh, did a grave disservice to people because, let's face it, many people see a headline, remember the headline, and that's how they interpret the reality of what the article is about. And of course, if you read this uh, Julian Barnes piece in the New York Times, you come away from the, uh, with it with the idea that, oh, I guess it's all been explained. I guess those videos that we saw and all that and all this uh, hue and cry about UAP may actually be real. I guess 
I guess that's all been explained. I guess it must be drones or something. On to the next. And I think that is a grave, grave disservice that he did. Just on that point, one of the key allegations that was made in the Barnes New York Times story was that the Pentagon has backtracked on its findings, its original findings in relation to the three Navy videos, the Go Fast, the Gimbal and the Fleur One. And it was a key allegation in that New York Times story that what we're going to see in this UAP report is a walking back by the Pentagon, that they're going to say that they can explain at least two of those videos. What I find is very, very interesting is that the Pentagon spokesperson, Susan Goff, has taken issue with at least one point in the New York Times article, and it's on this issue. She's told CAARIU News a couple of days ago that the Pentagon has not backtracked on its findings in relation to the three Navy videos. <laughs> that the findings by the US Navy in relation to what it could not explain about those videos still stand. Well, I think that's very important. It needs to go on the record that the New York Times, yes, even the old grey lady, gets stories wrong. I, I have to say, I'm about to say something, Ross, that I don't think I have ever said on this program and, and frankly don't anticipate saying again in the future, but God bless Susan Goff. I mean, <laughs> I, yeah. she's, she's become a, a controversial character, as many people know, because she speaks for the Pentagon. She's the spokesperson. And so she's been kind of the point person on this and, and has sort of fallen short to most people's uh, point of view in terms of doing the job when it comes to UAP. So for her to push back against the times, I think, shows something. And I'm glad that she did it. I hope that she'll take that responsibility more seriously in the future too and, and, um, and help get the facts out. Because let's face it, there are lots of people involved in this story now. And uh, we're all chasing facts. Uh, some, of the, some of us are chasing the government that is chasing facts. But at the end of the day, people are less concerned about an individual uh, UAP event. And there are many, and there are many new ones that we could talk about, and we will with our guests that are coming up. But at the end uh, of the day, I, what can, people... Can, yeah, yeah, sure. I just, I just, there's one point I really want to emphasize yeah. with the New York Times. The implications of that Julian Barnes story are enormous because it suggests that possibly deliberately false information was led to one of America's, one of the world's greatest newspapers. And this isn't the first time this has happened. As I said, journalists are only ever as good as their sources. And there's a long yeah. history in the Times of getting major stories wrong. And people don't need to tie themselves in knots worrying about what the New York Times says because even the Times gets the yarns wrong. Back in the Russian Revolution, they said the Bolsheviks were going to lose. They reported fake Bolshevik atrocities and said 91 times the regime was on the point of total collapse. The Times suppressed evidence of the genocide of European Jews during World War II. And who could forget the New York Times falsely suggested that Saddam Hussein was obtaining nuclear weapons material and was one of the papers that led us to war in the Middle East. It also held back on its reporting of the NSA's warrantless surveillance program during the Bush-Kerry 2004 election at right. the request of the White House. So I just think people need to understand that we are at a very important point in the history of this UAP issue. Oh. There is a gigantic pushback coming from the Pentagon, particularly from the US Air Force, and they've shown their card in a very foolish and reckless way. And let's, uh, let's use that as a transitional moment because the truth is uh, the New York Times is a controversial newspaper anyway right now. Uh, part of the country doesn't want to hear anything from them. Some people say they're the newspaper of record, okay? They're controversial. They haven't always gotten it right. They are not getting this one particularly right, although we still give them credit for getting it right in December of 2017 when they broke that original article. So it's a mixed bag when you come to the New York Times. But the good news is uh, we don't need only 
the U.S. military or only the U.S. government or only the New York Times to tell us what the facts are. We have an army of uh, civilian researchers uh, looking into things, and I think that's wonderful. And that's why uh, I want to introduce our two guests. We've, we, we'd like to open the conversation up because, let's face it, uh, we're all in this together. Over time, all of us are going to have to wake up and say, I guess there is something going on here. Maybe I should be somewhat concerned about it. Two of the people I listen to, and I know Ross listens to in this field, are with us today. Uh, we have Christina Gomez, who, uh, Christina, nice to see you and welcome. She is the host of the Paradigm Shifts uh, podcast and three others. Frankly, you are the hardest working podcaster in podcasting Jeez. right now. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and our, yeah. and our, our other guest is Ryan Robbins, who is uh, the post-disclosure world uh, man. I, I, I almost called you a guru. Maybe I will. Uh, Ryan, you started as UFO Jesus and have evolved into Ryan Robbins. So uh, I, I, I can't let that stand without asking, how did you go from UFO Jesus, which was kind of a... a just an internet. I mean, I, it was a meme. You were a meme almost, I guess. Uh, I loved it. I, I was actually really disappointed Ryan stopped being UFO Jesus. I loved it. Yeah, I sometimes I, I, I still hearken back to it. But I think when I started out, I just st I started out as Ryan. And then some people in the comment section was like, hey, it's UFO Jesus. So it's not like a nickname that I created. It was my audience that created it. So I thought it was creative and I decided to run with it for a while. And then later I'm like, okay, I, I think I've had my fill and I'm kind of kind of slightly maneuver back to my, my real name, Ryan Robbins. So every once in a while, if I'm feeling in a humorous mood, I'll, I'll bring it back. But generally, yeah, I generally these days I go by Ryan Robbins. And Christina, I'd like to just hear from you a little bit because you, um, you're the youngest person on this panel, which is no surprise to anybody who's looking at it, I guess. How does a person who is, you're still in college, you're going to be graduating, I believe, next year. How do you find the time for ufology, and why do you find the time for ufology? I have the time because I have insomnia. And when it comes to the topic of the UFO phenomenon, everything unexplained and mysterious, I have an absolute passion for it. And that passion, it gives me that drive. It gives me that energy alongside caffeine, of course. But <laughs> producing four shows a week on my channel, it looks at everything unexplained because i truly believe that there is a convergence between the ufo phenomenon and the paranormal there it's not just one thing to look at it's all of these different things it creates this beautiful mural and that we that we are able to see a little bit better than if we just look at one topic in particular and i'm very specifically bringing this topic to my generation gen z to get them involved to get them interested because they are going to be our future lawyers politicians and teachers and i truly believe that this topic this conversation that we're going to have today is the most important conversation that humanity is having right now okay well let's start then let's talk about what we're really here for which is the forthcoming UAP report to Congress. And we do have some insights. I've been able to verify with intelligence sources that Josh Boswell's excellent Daily Mail story is pretty much on the money. So the, the report to Congress, according to Josh Boswell of the Daily Mail, is that there have been 150 cases of unexplained UFO encounters by military and government officials in the past year. It's a 22-page report compiled by the ODNI, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. It's analysed 366 cases, and it says that only about half of them could be explained. Mm. Now, I think the, the simple fact that you have a Pentagon report reporting to Congress after 12 months and acknowledging that there are genuine, unexplained, anomalous phenomena that they cannot dismiss prosaically is enormously significant. What's your take? Ryan, I, I, think, I think it's incredibly significant, especially when you consider the military apparatus that is at the disposal of the United States government. I mean, if you compare the the spending of the military with the United States, any other country, it's it doesn't even compare. And, um, you know, even Elizondo said himself, and I, I repeat this over and over again because I think it's so important. He said that the go fast, the FLIR one and the gimbal videos are some of the least compelling videos 
that are out there that are in the possession of the U.S. government of of captures of UAP. And and so I, I think if we were to look at this realistically, the Tic Tac event, the Gimbal event, the Go Fast event is only the tip of the iceberg. Um, a lot of these events have remained secret. Um, witnesses have not come forward, but I think eventually the other the other UFO event series, of which there almost certainly it are, is going to come to the fore, and uh, we're going to realize that um, the corroboration and in, in technical evidence the military has of this phenomena is far greater than we can possibly imagine. Hey, Christina, let me frame this for what you just said in your last answer. Um, I do want to hear what you think about this upcoming report, but what does Gen Z know about this report? Do they care about it? And I assume they probably don't. Why don't they care about it? That's a great question. When we are looking at people in their late 20s and going younger, it's not a question on if alien life exists, extraterrestrials and UFOs and things like this. It's not a question. For the most part, they think it's just the way of the universe now. Mm. But when it comes to these reports provided by the government that we are beginning to receive now, they don't care. Why is that? Well, my generation, they already are on the mindset that they don't listen to mainstream media. They don't really listen to the government. They don't really care what they have to say because it's not significant in their life. What is significant is looking at maybe videos to watch the podcasts that we're doing here, watching documentaries to get the 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 overview of these kind of sometimes very wordy papers that for them because they're not into the field they don't really understand the terminology they don't really understand what's going on so they'd much rather listen to us speak give them the explanation or watch documentaries and things like this and that is more interesting than reading some report where our last one the preliminary report was about nine pages this next one is supposed to be 22 pages Pages, but out of those 22 pages, how much of those are going to be made public? They don't they don't ask these questions. They don't care. They want the evidence. They want the videos. They want the photos. They want the conversation. But they don't care what the government has to say about it. Do you think uh, that the government do, do you think that the government is holding back for any good reason? I mean, what's the view amongst your generation about why the government is holding back? If they accept that there's a reality there, why is the government re restraining the public on knowing what's going on? First off, we have not seen any smoking guns yet. Just as, just as Ryan had mentioned, we haven't seen anything big. These these other photos, such as the gimbal and the go fast and so on, yeah, they're intriguing to us people in the field. But for your average person walking down the street, they're like, I'm looking at a blob here. There's nothing really interesting going on. Now, as for the fact to your question, Ross, on why does my generation think that the government's not coming out with this information? It's kind of hard to say because once again, they just don't really care what the government has to say because time and time again for decades, it's just been lie after lie after lie from them. And, and a good example of this would be Project Blue Book, where their whole purpose of it was to debunk UFOs. My generation is, is aware of that, at least vaguely to where whatever they have to say, eh, it doesn't really matter. You know, Ryan, that's a follow up on that. It is kind of an article of faith that the government has lied to us about UFOs. I mean, there's been ample opportunity in 75 years since uh, the summer of 47, for example, uh, where Roswell happened and, and the Kenneth Arnold sighting kind of got things started. They've had ample opportunity to outright lie about it, to create subterfuge around it. So if the government has been lying all this time, why do we care what the government says right now about it? Uh, well, unfortunately, the, as far as I know, there are no smoking guns in the public domain. I don't know why that is. We, we can form all kinds of weird hypotheses about it. I know I do that. But for whatever reason, it could be because this phenomena is attracted to uh, military operations or nuclear uh, capabilities. But for whatever reason, it's the United States military and other militaries that have all the good stuff, whether it's the alleged uh, retrieval of materials or biological specimens, all the way to 
uh, high fidelity gun camera videos taken by F-18 Hornets. And so, and, and so, and, but we also live in a world where we listen to our institutions and there, there, it gives validity to the subject, to the mystery when the government comes out and says, yes, this is real. And this is what we know about it, especially in an environment where frankly, our world institutions, uh, ubiquitously look at this as hogwash and they have for many decades. And I think a lot of that is due to the stigma that has been propagated by the US government with their propaganda. And now that's starting to erode. And now the government is starting to be more transparent, although not nearly to the degree that they should. And as a result of their increased transparency, learning about, for example, a tip that that at the close of Project Blue Book, it wasn't the end of the United States government's interest in this topic. Now, all of a sudden, you see Project Galileo with Dr. Avi Loeb getting interested in it and other uh, efforts. And you see it being covered by the media almost on a weekly basis. Why? The phenomenon okay. has never gone away. It's because the government's tone on the topic has shifted. Okay, the government's tone has shifted. I agree. And I, I agree that there has been revelations from papers like the New York Times. But isn't there the risk? Can I put this to you? Isn't there the risk that this is still just very much a marginal area of interest for a fairly small number of people, ourselves included? Isn't there a risk that if there isn't momentum, for example, in the midterm elections with this becoming an election issue, if there's not major revelations, smoking gun videos, it's all going to die and disappear for another 50 years? Or do you think that your generation is not going to let this go? Well, I'll say this. I'll say, look, uh, if, you, if you look at the Nimitz event, if you look at the USS Roosevelt event, with the Nimitz event, they started seeing these things, as far as I recollect, when they started upgrading the radar. With the USS Roosevelt event, they started seeing these things when they upgraded the radar. So I think we're in an environment now where the technology is just getting way, way better. And so, you know, even, even the military industrial complex that doesn't seem very interested at all in being transparent about this topic, their technology, their ability to track things in our atmosphere and our oceans is getting better and better. The military knows that. The United States Congress knows that. It's just common sense. So my perspective is, even if we don't get the smoking gun anytime soon, we are on an inevitable trajectory where this stuff is just going to come to light. It's inevitable because it's real and it's in our atmosphere. And of course, I always, I always caveat this. I could be wrong, but this is my analysis. And so I think, the, I think the national security apparatus is playing a really dangerous game because if they keep trying to kick the, the, the can down the field and try to delay this as much as possible, what, what is the inevitable outcome of that? It's an erosion in trust in government. They, they know this is going to come out. They're smarter than I am. I know it's going to come out. They know it's going to come out 10 times more. And yet they're still playing this game of obfuscation, delay, uh, trying to downplay the topic. Inev inevitably, the whole world is going to realize how incredibly important this topic is. And it's going to be crystal clear what the U.S. government did with all their propaganda and all their efforts and all their stonewalling and all their delaying. And it's just going to erode. It's going to erode trust. So is, is that the patriotic thing for the U.S. government to do? Is that the patriotic thing for the national security apparatus to do? I don't think so. And I take and I take offense to it. Yeah, I nicely said. Uh, I'll just uh, uh, listen, Christina. Uh, I wrote a book with uh, Richard Dolan years ago called uh, After Disclosure, and one of the things that Richard always said when we were doing interviews is he said that the, our technology was getting so good that we were about to be able to leap into their world, right? Which is sort of another way of what Ryan was just saying. Our technology for the military has gotten so good that. Uh, we have better radar, we have better ways to observe these things. Do you think uh, as our civilian technology improves, do you think uh, your generation, any generation, is prepared to pick that up and say, if the government's going to slow walk this, we're going to go out and do it ourselves? Here's the thing. Kids are head heads down in their phones and they're looking for alternative news sources S stuff that's you know fun and i guess news that's more geared towards this generation honestly most of my peers are not interested in what the government has to say there there's a very small percentage of them who uh, are like you know politically motivated you know like uh, activists but tv shows and documentaries they have seen growing up 
always like are they always pushing up pushing the the uh, cover up narrative you would think so right so whether it's tv sci-fi drama or documentaries kids are skeptical for the most part of what it, what the government will say on the topic so i guess in instead they rely on us people like us to decode that information but then again we live in a time of distractions and entertainment so it's really tough to get young people talking about these topics bryce Let's talk activism for a second. You mentioned that word. Um, Ross and I are old enough to remember people going out on the streets uh, for anti-war, the Vietnam War, uh, for civil rights, etc. Do you see this as an issue that eventually will bring people onto the streets in, a, in, a, in an activist way to demand change? I sure do hope so, but it seems that currently a lot of the um people holding signs and going out in the streets there's a lot of uh hatred involved now with this topic that we're looking at the ufo phenomenon it's not really about those kinds of things it's about getting the truth out there it's about getting that transparency from the government very specifically so I don't know how it will go in the near future. I hope people are on the streets demanding answers because they are asking, we are asking the big questions. And the big question is, are we alone? And most kids assume that we're not. If the media is as fractured as you suggest, Christina, if, if and I, I've, this with my daughters as well, I mean, they don't watch mainstream media. I sit with my wife and watch the TV news and my kids think that's very quaint. And I read newspapers, which is absurd to them. You know, they've all got their data and their media from social media. But if the media is as fractured as you suggest, it's very hard, isn't it, to get momentum on any issue. I think it's why... You know, there are so many crises in your and my society because it's very hard to galvanize public opinion. How, how you know, I appreciate that podcasts like yours and Ryan's are, are important, and I hope ours as well. But I think, isn't the issue that the, there always is going to be needing to be a momentum in mainstream media to actually get a push through on this issue? Because the opinion leaders, the people in the positions of power in the Congress, the gatekeepers, particularly in the US Air Force, who are obfuscating and causing difficulty in terms of disclosure, I don't think they want this out. And I'm actually quite bleak at the moment. I'm very concerned that essentially what we're going to see is a pushback which finally shuts down mainstream media coverage of this issue, unless there is a major smoking gun revelation. Do you really think that podcast social media can cut through and provide momentum in public opinion absolutely i do because now more than ever young people they're not looking at the mainstream media they're looking at social media for all of their news and while for some that can that can sound a little bit disappointing that's just the way that we're going so for those that are really pushing this conversation across social media they're touching new minds every single day much faster than what so uh, the mainstream media could do or newspapers could do social media is so fast these days it's unbelievable you never know if one of your videos or one of your papers are going to go viral until after it happens sometimes you just don't expect that so i think that we have a bright future when it comes to this topic and it coexisting with social media. If you're listening to Need to Know right now, you're, uh, you just heard from Christina Gomez of uh, Paradigm Shifts, the uh, podcast, and several others. We also have Ryan uh, Robbins of the uh, Post Disclosure World. I, I look at you, Rob. <laughs> Robin, Ryan, I look at you, Ryan, as an analyst as much as anything. Um, and I wonder, as an analyst, do you think what Ross said is actually possible? Can you put the toothpaste back in the tube after we've gotten people ginned up to want to demand answers here? I don't believe you can, partly because there's been too many military witnesses that have come forward, whether that's uh, Commander David Fravor or former Lieutenant Ryan Graves, um, various radar operators, radar operators, and they've been very transparent about their assessment of what they've 
encountered in, in uh, UAP encounters. And just as an example, if you just look at the, the USS Nimitz UFO event series, I've paid very close attention to every single witness that has come forward. And people can correct me if I'm wrong, but there is not one witness that has stated that what was encountered that day was not technology surpassing all known technology of unknown origin. Some of them may think it's from a black project, but none of them thinks it was a glitch on the radar or an optical illusion. All of them believe and assess that it was extraordinary technology. And beyond that, as far as I understand, the United States Congress has seen much higher fidelity data than, than we have. Mm. And I'm going to share with you a quote. I just have it open. This is from um, July of 2019. And this was, I believe it was something that um, Richard Hoffman, of, who was a SCU board member, I think that's a scientific coalition for UAP studies. He, he quoted and he said this. He said, I'm going to quote, I'm going to do it right now. Lou Elizondo told me straight out that these clips, Floor One, Gimbal, Go Fast, are not the whole video. That in fact, there were incredible evidence showing performance beyond our capabilities and the remaining portions that are indeed classified. The general public is getting just a taste, but not the full meal. The senators got the full meal in the recent briefings. Assuming this is correct, um, the, the bottom line is the, 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 the members of Congress have just seen way too much data at this point as far as I can ascertain. And if you just look at what our members of Congress have said about the phenomena, that, that supports the contention that they have seen much better data than we have. So no, I don't think you can put the toothpaste back in the, in the, in the tube. And then you have people like Harvard scientists Dr. Avi Loeb, who's pursuing it independently um, and even has, I think, on the board of, of members to, to, to assist with that project is Luis Elizondo, who knows what to look for, knows where to look. So now I, I don't see the toothpaste going back into the tube personally. Uh, Ross, you and I have talked about something a lot. I want to throw it as a jump ball out there. What Ross and I talk about all the time is we hear about briefings with 23 minute videos. We hear that the three videos that were released, there's longer versions and higher def, et cetera. And while we understand classification because you don't want to tell your enemies, your sources and methods, what we don't seem to understand is why would that prevent you from confirming a basic fact, we are not alone, and showing a piece of video a data, as you called it, a piece of video that confirms that. Why don't we at least confirm the basic reality that we're facing? Do you know, I actually think I'm increasingly coming to the view that the best explanation for that reluctance, that timidity by the, the national security establishment is, as I've said previously, they just don't like admitting that they're confounded by this mystery. Um, yes, I suspect that the United States government is in possession of technology, but I don't think they understand a great deal about it. I don't think they actually know a great deal. And I think for all of the trillions of dollars that the United States is and has spent on defence and national security and intelligence, I don't think that, the, I think there's a type of personality that controls these budgets and controls the information flow from these entities that just doesn't like admitting they have no bloody idea. Do you agree? Well, I mean, what do well, you think? I think we should also throw this out there. We are, uh, because all four of us here uh, on a daily basis are, are sampling what people are saying and seeing the trend lines. And one of the trend lines I see that people talk about is this feeling that somehow uh, what has been revealed in the past week or so with a couple of these articles is that there must be some kind of war with internal war within the Pentagon or within the government. Some people obviously seem to favor coming clean to the extent possible about this, and others seem to be uh, more in favor of keeping it bottled up. Uh, Christina, do you, do you take that position? And, and if so, do you, how do we resolve it? I think for a lot of people, it's very difficult for them to admit that they were wrong, that they didn't understand the information. And like Ross had mentioned just a little bit earlier, for the most part, at least to, to my understanding, the majority of people that are looking into this have no idea what's going on. And that can be very difficult to admit because you're showing weakness first off, and probably the most dangerous thing that you could ever do when you're a part of the government is showing weakness. And in this case, because it is a full-blown mystery, they, they can't just say, 
no, I have no idea what's going on. Sorry, guys. You you paid me billions of dollars with your taxes, but uh, yeah, I don't know what's going on here. That's terrible to tell the public, right? I mean, how do you think the public would react to something like that? Sorry, I don't know. Well, let's let's use a specific example here. I mean, the, the Josh Boswell story in the mail suggests that there are videos, not released, still classified, shot by Reaper drones that have been conducting surveillance in the Middle East that have caught orbs flying around them and then suddenly bolting off the screen. Ryan, what, what do you think would happen if such a video was released? I think people would be absolutely fascinated. I think uh, people would be fascinated... People would want to know more. I think the scientific community would want to know more. I think our greatest innovators, such as Jeff Bezos and others, would uh, maybe potentially, depending upon how clear these videos are and, and you know how good the data is, they would be curious about how, how, how are these things moving? What kind of propulsion system do they have? And then maybe it would be a spark of some kind of evolution within the scientific community to pursue other means of, of, of power, getting off oil, um, I, I think it could begin, be the beginning of that, depending upon how good the videos are. Um, but I don't buy the argument that people would panic in the street or there'd be unrest if it was dropped on humanity that we're not alone. I mean, there, there, are, there are nuclear missiles in China and Russia pointing at Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. right now. We're just getting off uh, well, we're not actually. We're still in the midst of a pandemic that's killed untold amount of people, made untold amount of people sick. It has it's wrecked the economy. Um, I, I like. I'm going to just go back to my fear that the longer the U.S. government drags this out, the more conducive that the environment is that the public will lose trust in the U.S. government. And um, if the U.S. government, those involved in the secrecy, want to diminish blowback, diminish any kind of disruption, ironically, within society, then they need to speed this process up. Uh, we've been doing the trickle thing for a long time now, and I think the argument for continuing the trickle thing, assuming, because I could be wrong, but assuming they have smoking gun data that would seal the deal is a grave mistake and uh, concerns me very, very deeply. Me too. Uh, I was cu- kind of curious for the whole group of us here. Um, does age impact impatience? I know that at, I'm at a certain age right now, and I'm impatient as hell. I'm, I've, I've, I've watched my entire life this thing, and for years I've been thinking, well, how much longer can this thing really uh, continue? And yet it, it continues. So now I'm just, I'm, I'm a little pissed off. I'm very impatient, uh, and I'm just wondering, uh, to the two of you, Ryan and Christina, are you impatient or do you th- are you willing to take a longer view and say, well, eventually this is going to get done? Uh, I'm obviously impatient. I want the information now, right now. Bring okay. it to me. I'm ready. But because, you know, I'm so used to getting everything instantaneously with Google and emails and texting and things like this. But when you bring my generation into this conversation, while some of the information can be incredibly tantalizing, looking at UFO encounters and abductions and things like this, again, when it comes to the government aspect of it, they couldn't care less. So if they get this report today or in a year, it's it's not going to be a part of their daily conversation when they're out for lunch or something like this. But for myself, and I know I'm speaking for hopefully everyone here, we want the information right. now because this really is the most important conversation that humanity is having. Do you think your generation think that, though? I mean, you're obviously quite extraordinary and exceptional in terms of your interest in this subject matter. Uh, is there not a lassitude, an indifference amongst young people towards the subject matter, or are they engaged? Are they interested? I believe that they are rather engaged in the conversation. Once again, looking at the movies that they grew up with, the documentaries, the TV shows, and now with social media. The only issue with at the moment is that videos that are getting millions of views are those that are very easy to tell that they are CGI. Now, if you were to post a video of an orb or something kind of blurry, they're like, oh man, this is so boring. They, in a sense, Mm. they do want to be entertained. They want to find this content tantalizing. But if, if we don't bring them, 
right what they want they're not going to be interested in it but here's the thing i want to turn that around i want to get everyone interested in the topic looking at all aspects of it i want young people to start demanding answers from the government because they're not doing that right now but they will at some point i mean let's let's talk for example about the 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 simple fact that there is a uh uh uh, an election looming in the United States. Uh, I, I think that one of the explanations that is very clearly going to form part of the report that's going to come down probably in the next couple of days is the explanation that that a lot of these objects that have been thought of as unexplained UAPs are in fact allegedly, we are told, Chinese or Russian mm -hmm. drones. Now, Bryce and I explored this in a documentary earlier in the year it may very well be. I mean, some of the images that have been posted uh, in publicly available information by the US Navy suggest that some of these might be drones. But what do you think of that explanation? What do you think of the idea that the public are being led to the view that these are Chinese drones? I mean, what concerns me is the idea that implicitly the United States government, by saying that, is admitting it's not in control of its own airspace. It's basically saying, yeah, you know what, we, we see these things hovering over our ships and we don't engage them, we don't shoot at them, there's not much we can do about them because there's hordes of them swarming us. I, I don't get it. I just truly think that, that that explanation raises even more grave concerns of a national security nature. In many ways, they're in danger by using that explanation of drones, aren't they in danger of putting themselves on a slippery slope to an admission that undermines public confidence in the military and the defence even more than the current intransigent lack of transparency that they're showing to the UAP issue? Well, drones are just oh, the ahead. new drones are just the new swamp gas and weather balloons. That's it. And, and, the, and the old excuse for what some of these objects are, such as weather balloons or Venus, they won't wash up. They, 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 won't, they, won't, they won't vibe with young people. And, and I can tell you this. So neither will airborne trash or Chinese drones, okay? That's an insult for all of these pilots coming forward. So when you have these elite government study study groups pushing those solutions it just gets laughed off really it's silly yeah, ryan? i want to i want to uh, pull ryan in on this as a, a from post disclosure world ryan robbins um ryan if we take for uh as an article of faith, what we just said at the beginning, where Ross uh, iterated what the Daily Mail was stating was probably going to be in this report and how it seems to check out, which is 22 pages that basically come down to we've looked at 366 new cases and about half of them we can't explain. All right. That's that should be fairly attention getting to people, but do you think that's anything that could have any impact whatsoever in the current midterm elections, which are a week away? I, I think so. I mean, it's a, it's a huge national security issue. I mean, if you have uh, surveillance vehicles um, recording military operations and collecting data on strat strategy of, of the United States Navy, and that's all being... Um, transmitted to the Chinese uh, military and uh, intelligence apparatus. That's pretty disturbing. And that needs to be addressed. And um, I think those uh, candidates who put a lot of emphasis on that will be well received. Uh, it's certainly not something to gloss over. But regarding the idea that a lot of this is coming from China, um, we should learn more about how they're pulling it off. Where are these Chinese drones taking off from? Because for example, Lieutenant Ryan Graves, he was doing operations off the eastern seaboard. And as I recollect, he said almost on a daily basis, him and others in his squadron were, were picking these things up on multiple sensors. These are not objects that are coming off the Chinese coast where the United States is encroaching on the Chinese coast. These are these are happening, what, 10, 20 miles off the United States coast. So where are these objects taking off from? How are they uh, getting in close proximity to our carrier strike groups? And then without being blown out of the sky, how are they returning to where they're taking off from? I think that kind of information is going to have to be made crystal clear to the American people. 
because it's not good enough to say, oh, they're Chinese. Well, tell us more. Where, where are they coming from? How are they getting here? I mean, it's, it's pretty startling when you really think about it. I want to give you props for the way you phrased that, <clears throat> Ryan, because that does seem like a, an effective way to take on the Chinese drone or anybody's drone kind of point of view, which is to say, OK, well, let's work with that for a minute. Uh, if you're going to take that argument, then how does that physically work in the real physical world? And, and I think your point is well taken. You know, one thing I wanted to ask you, though, Ryan, is you've got something called post-disclosure world. I wrote a book called After Disclosure. Uh, what's disclosure mean to you these days? What, what do you mean by post-disclosure? That almost feels like there is an event and everything is before it, and then there's an event and everything is after. That's certainly what I was thinking when Dolan and I wrote after disclosure. What are you thinking with post-disclosure? Well, unfortunately, the word disclosure is, um, is highly ridiculed. <laughs> I'm not, I guess I, I, I kind of understand. Maybe part of it is because people have been burned for so long by the United States being transparent about um, coming clean on UAP, so they just like to ridicule the word. Maybe part of why it's ridiculed is because people have been saying for so long that disclosure is going to happen. I'm sure I've, I've been responsible for that to some extent. But ultimately, to me, and, and you know, there is no agreed upon definition of disclosure. So we're allowed to, we're allowed to apply whatever definition we want until there's an official definition. To me, disclosure is very simple. All disclosure is, is when smoking gun evidence of the phenomena emerges that is so, so epistemologically scientific that the entire world and all institutions have to accept that we are not alone in the universe and we're being engaged by something that does not originate from human intelligence. To me, that's what disclosure is. So disclosure does not have to come from a government. It can come from um, a mass sighting where a bunch of people are able to get adequate footage of it, or it could come from someone like Dr. Abu Loeb in his Galileo project with Harvard getting the evidence. As long as it meets that measure of epistemology, then we have disclosure. So to me, that is what disclosure is. And of course, for my usage of disclosure, there is the assumption that there is a phenomena out there. Um, I can't prove it, unfortunately, and I know I could be wrong, but when you look at the patterns that have emerged over and over again, over decades and decades, when you look at FOIA documents and how they've treated the phenomena and what, you, what, what modern day uh, Navy aviators and op radar operators are saying, uh, I feel fairly confident that this phenomena is real and that it does not originate from human intelligence. The way you're defining disclosure in a way sounds like confirmation. You, you, you would feel pretty good if they would just say, here's some tape. This stuff is real. Talk to you later. That, yeah, that would at I, least get us I off the dime. And I, and I think it's a very, I think it's, I'm just going to go say it. I think it's tragic. I think that tragic, tragic is the right word. I think it's tragic if, in fact, there are compartments within the United States government or American aerospace companies or other governments or foreign aerospace companies that have the smoking gun evidence. Because what it amounts to is a very small number of humanity uh, having access to earth-shattering knowledge about our universe, keeping it to themselves, and, and letting the rest of us seven-plus billion people be in the dark about the true nature of our reality. And, it, and it, what, it, what it ultimately inevitably does is it holds back the progression of science. Because as soon as you have disclosure, now you're just flooded with a whole bunch of questions. For example, even, even questions that seem outlandish. For example... Has this phenomena meddled with human uh, DNA? Um, has it been trying to manipulate us over the decades? Why is it here? Um, and on and on it goes. There's so many questions that, that right now would be considered science fiction or ridiculous. Uh, another question is how are, how, are they, how are they maneuvering without wings or without any um, uh, clear means of propulsion? These questions would start flooding in and they would permeate the minds of our our greatest scientists and engineers. And there is a small number of people on this planet that are precluding that. And I'm sure they, they come up with all kinds of creative justifications. But you know what, I'll, I'll say this, because I know that Ross Colthart, and I found this really fascinating, he once said, look, I've been a journalist, I've kept information from the public before, knowing that it's in the best interest of the public. If the United States government or any government would just tell me a good reason of why they're keeping it secret, I would remove myself from the conversation. And up until this day, as far as I know, and Ross, you can correct me if I'm wrong, nobody from the Pentagon or the DIA or any aerospace companies said, hey, Ross, 
This is why we're keeping the rest of the world in the dark. And, and here's your chance to, to realize why it's justified. That hasn't happened, has it, Ross? Oh, boy, I've really tried, Ryan. Yeah, no, that's a very sharp question. No, I've, I've, I have. I've had conversations with many people in, at a senior level in three-letter agencies who admit that they are as vexed as you are by the intransigence of the gatekeepers. And I, it's funny because I, I used to think that there was some dark conspiracy. To me, the most plausible explanation is, and this is what I hope is the case, frankly, we are in dangerous times. I think there was a much cleverer and much more determined rollout happening way back in 2015, 2016. I think that we probably got a spanner in the works because of the pandemic and also because of the deteriorating international situation. I think there are now people, particularly in the US Air Force, I'm told, who are basically saying now is not the time. And it's exactly the same stunt that's been pulled pretty much decade after decade after over the last 75 years. Um, I, I, I routinely have conversations with people in intelligence and defense in the United States and in my own country and in other countries who are telling me this is real, that there is a genuine anomalous phenomenon that is a, 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 it is possibly non-human intelligence, more likely than not non-human intelligence. And they are as vexed and as confounded as you and I are about why the public can't be told this. I suspect the most plausible explanation that they're holding back is, one, they don't like admitting that they don't understand it, and two, they're hoping that they can develop the technologies and master the technologies that lie behind it. And that would give America or whichever country controls it a strategic advantage. But I still don't understand, even on that rationale, I don't understand why the public well, can't be told. Here's one possibility. Uh, I, I think it's no surprise to anybody that our country and in fact the world is a pretty chaotic place right now. Uh, Ryan touched upon a little bit about that with the pandemic and all that, but also we live in a country right now in the United States where we're pretty evenly split. Uh, people have lacked, uh, lost the ability to talk to each other in a kind of a reasonable way. And uh, it's just getting tougher and tougher to, to non to, to see things not be politicized. So Christina, I'm kind of wondering from your point of view, uh, is that a reason why you think they might be holding back on doing this? They just don't think that we can, if we can't even handle our current reality. How would we handle this enhanced reality? It makes me question, well then what time is the right time? There are so Beautiful. many quotes that go, the right time is now because the next moment, we don't even know if it'll ever come. It's the same thing that my father says. Yeah, yeah, we'll do it tomorrow. And it's like, Dad, it's tomorrow. Tomorrow's tomorrow. It hasn't been tomorrow yet. And so with that I like kind your of dad mentality. Already. <laughs> <laughs> well, he raised me uh, with yeah. Twilight Zone. Best TV show on the planet. Yeah. But it's if, if you harbor that mentality, right, then there will never be a right time. Never, ever. The right time is now, no matter the situation. You know, we're getting toward uh, the end here, Ross, where we got to wrap this up. But I wanted to throw one thing out there. I was uh, at a UFO conference a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things they did on a panel is ask people, well, how did you first tip to this this thing. And I know, uh, Christina, for example, I've listened to a number of your podcasts where you're asking people that you have on as guests, well, how did you first get involved or whatever? My question is, let's turn it around on, on this group here. Christina, how did you first say, you know, this interests me enough that I'm actually going to lose sleep over it and, uh, and, I, and I'm going to try to make my own uh, impact in it. What, what happened? How did that happen for you? Well, it originally started with my father, and we used to binge watch The Twilight Zone every New Year's. And it was from there, because of that TV show, looking at all of these mysterious topics that got me interested. But it wasn't until I moved very far away from home to enter university, where at that time I had a lot of free time on my hands, which is no longer a thing. But it was from that moment where I thought, I want to have this conversation. People on my campus... I don't want to talk to me about this stuff. They're like, hold on, Christina, let's 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 take a few substances and then we can have this conversation. And I'm yeah. just like, what do you mean? I want to talk about this now. They look at their clock and they're like, 
it's literally 8 a.m. Okay, no, we're not doing this. <laughs> and so then I began to go online and attempt to find like-minded people to have this conversation because I truly wanted and I still want to understand what the heck is going on? Because even to this day, I don't have the answers. If anything, I have so many more questions than answers from when I first started onward. But I'm so passionate about it that I'm going to keep researching it until I cross over. How about you, Ryan? What's your uh, what's your initiation story? Well, you know, I've always sort of been interested in, in UAP. But what really... Uh, lit a fire underneath my behind to engage this subject on a, on a YouTube channel was the October 11th, 2017 conference with To The Stars Academy. When I saw all these high level people such as um, Jim Semivan from the Central Intelligence Agency and the number three guy from Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, I can't, his name slips me, but and then Lou Elizondo and Lou Elizondo said it was it was in this experience of being the head of a UAP program that I recognized the phenomena is indeed real. It was pretty obvious to me that this was significant. Even if even if we were to argue as a psyops, it's still significant. A psyop amongst the on, on, on to the American <clears throat> people would still be significant. So right there and then I said, this this is huge, man. This is huge. So I'm like, I'm getting in the game. So it was like I was busy with something. I don't remember how far after that news conference was, but I think it was like a two or three weeks. And then I just started making video after video and I haven't stopped since then. And what really drives me, to be honest, uh, some people may think uh, what drives me is I, I enjoy being a D-list UFO celebrity, <laughs> but that's really not what drives me. Although I, I do kind of enjoy it, but it really <laughs> hasn't uh, done anything for me. But what really drives me, quite frankly, is I want to be part of the conversation. That's what yeah. drives me. I want what I think and my assessment to enter the conversation. And I've, I've been blessed to do that because I have a pretty big Twitter following. I have a pretty big YouTube following. So not to toot my own horn. And, you know, I'm sure I say stupid things all the time, but I do have a, a pretty a fairly large audience when all things are considered. And that's what I wanted because I wanted to have an influence on the conversation. That's what drives me. That's what drives me every single day, basically. And that's about it. Yeah, I think the, wow. the point to make here is you're absolutely right. One of the things you guys have both focused me on today is that whilst there is an attempt to put this all back in the bottle, as happened probably after Roswell in 1947, mainstream media was very easily controlled. I mean, we know, for example, the, the telegraph operators were basically told not to retransmit the story on the day. Um, it's harder to do that these days. It's harder to put it back in the bottle. And yes, uh, to address what Christina was talking about, the media is more fragmented. The mainstream media is largely irrelevant in this debate. It's making itself irrelevant in the debate. But what is fascinating and what is really heartening is to see people like you guys and hopefully us, Bryce and I, coming forward and talking about this issue and entering the conversation. And I, I just want to leave people with the observation, we don't need the Wall Street Journal the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, to tell us that this story is real. They've made themselves irrelevant with their inability to engage with it in an objective and sensible way. So I, I think the big lesson for me is I come away from talking to you guys heartened. You too, Bryce? I, I do. I want to thank uh, Ryan and Christina for for appearing with us today and, and, and taking this conversation forward. I, I am an optimist about this thing. I, I, um, I don't know if the toothpaste back in the tube is the right metaphor, but I am profoundly of the opinion that we've gone too far and that it isn't going to be possible in today's media environment, as you called it, a fragmented one, with people like Ryan and Christina and, frankly, you and me, Ross, and all the other people who are involved in this, for it to just go away. It was a lot easier in 1969 when they folded up Blue Book. 
uh, for people to say, oh, I guess they looked into it because that's where you got your answers. I don't think we get the answers from those people, as you pointed out, uh, like we used to. So I'm very uh, optimistic about it. And I just wanted to close out by giving our two uh, guests here a chance to tell our audience where they can find them in this fragmented media environment. So Christina, we'll start with you. Tell us, tell our people where, where they can find you and hear you and listen to your thoughts. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me on. It is such a pleasure to speak with all of you. Um, your audience can find me on my website at strangeparadigms.com. There you can find all of my social media from YouTube to the blogs I write to um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Discord, and things like this. Wow. But my yeah, but my YouTube channel is under my name, um, Christina Gomez. There is no H. It's just C-R-I-S-T-I-N-A. And there you can catch four shows a week plus my daily YouTube shorts as well. Four shows a week? Oh, come on. That's an overachiever. <laughs> Thanks for making time for us. That was insane. Uh, Ryan, where do we find you, my friend? I'm going to leave just one place. Go to YouTube and look up Post Disclosure World. These days, I'm really just mostly covering the news because in this current environment, very bizarrely, which I think is a testament to where, where, how far we've come, is that there's news on, like, on a weekly basis that is worthy of talking about and exploring. So go to YouTube and go to Post Disclosure World and you'll find me. And thank you for having me, Bryce and Ross. It was a pleasure. And it's I'll, I'll say pretty. this, by the way, about Ryan. Uh, it is true about your YouTube. It's fascinating. That's where I first found you. But I love your pithy little uh, tweets. I think you've mastered the art of raising big, big ideas in little, little amounts of words. And I hope that Elon Musk doesn't ever get in the way of you being <laughs> able to do that. Ross, I'm going to let you take us out. So thank you to both of you, Ryan and Christina, for sharing your thoughts. And we'll be back another time very soon, hopefully with a fresh NDAA required UFO UAP report to Congress to comment about sometime very, very soon on Need to Know. Thanks, everybody.